At this time, Pastor Vernon and Heidi are going to come and, and share. Thank you, Pastor Gary, for giving Heidi and I this moment to, to share with you. Calvary Temple, this church, is a part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, the PAOC. And one of the phrases that we've been using a lot when we get together as ministers of the PAOC is that we are family. And as a church, we're more than just a congregation. We are family. And family does life together with all the ups and all the downs, with all the bumps and bruises that we go through. We're still family. And that's how Heidi and I feel about each of you. So today we have some family news to share with you. Heidi and I have, been, have felt like we've been on a, a roller coaster of emotions and a whirlwind of life events and ministry events over the past number of weeks and months. And uh, recently we've had this growing awareness in our hearts that there was a change coming for us and possibly a change in our ministry involvements here in Calvary Temple, but we were unsure of what that would look like. In the last few weeks, it began to become more clear. Several months ago, one of our assistant district superintendents for the PAOC Manitoba Northwestern Ontario District announced his intentions to retire after 19 years of being in that role. This began a search for a new assistant superintendent, which included a nomination process and an interview. And then in Winnipeg this past week at our district conference, I was elected as the next assistant district superintendent for fellowship services. What this new role means for us is that I'll be stepping down from the role of executive pastor of Calvary Temple. And for Heidi, it will mean stepping down from the role of children's pastor of Calvary Temple. Our last Sunday of ministry will be Sunday, May 26th, and we will move to Winnipeg and begin in the district office sometime in June. Along with saying many goodbyes, Heidi and I intend to spend the next month ensuring that there is adequate care for each of the ministries that we're involved in with the hopes they can continue to flourish in the days to come. There'll be other opportunities to say farewell and words of blessing, so I won't say that today. But I do want to thank the board and the staff and the pastors of Calvary Temple, and especially Pastor Gary and Lana, our dear, dear friends for 24 years. For, for believing in us and for working alongside us and allowing us the privilege of ministering among you for 16 years. And to all of you, you are our friends, you are our family, and you've given us purpose to wake up each day and discover how we can work together for God's glory and learn from each other and spur one another on and together have such an amazing impact and influence on our community for the kingdom of God. Thank you for 16 wonderful, wonderful years of ministry. Thank you, friends. Would you stand with me again? And we're going to pray for Pastor Vernon and Heidi. And I know your prayers are We'll be joined together in prayer. And I want to say to you that God is in this. You know, as difficult as it is, and man, 24 years together, and how do I be Vernless? I don't know. And how do you be Garyless? Like, I won't be there to annoy you, and, and you won't be there to annoy me. But, anyways, God is in this. The wonderful thing about the church is that it is the Lord's. We work in the vineyard. We carry out ministry, and then we just answer the call day by day. What, God, do you want from me? We just lay ourselves out. The agenda is the Lord's, and that's what Pastor Vernon and Heidi have done. Lord, it's not about me, they've said. It's about the kingdom. If this is what God wants, we've prayed together and believed together. And God, if this is what you want, then let your will be done. And so I want to assure you, God is in this. It is his church. There is sadness, but there is excitement. And so it is that way that we come before the Lord this morning, thanking him 
for the years of ministry. So, Lord, I thank you for my friend. And, Lord, for what has been accomplished in this part of the field here in Brandon. And thank you for Pastor Vern. Thank you for Pastor Heidi and for their ministry. And they've given, they've given, they've given, they've given, they have given of themselves, of their time, of their energies, of their talents, of their gifts. Anything for the kingdom. That was their heart. And it still is their heart. It'd be easier to say, oh, let's just stay where it's comfortable. But that is not where you call us to. You call us to leave the comfort zone. And so, Lord, they are leaving the comfort zone and answering the call. It's a new territory. It's new responsibilities. It's new ministries. It's all new. But, Lord, you'll be there with them, and you'll guide them, and you'll lead them. And, and Lord, our hearts are heavy in saying goodbye, but also thanking you and praising you for what has been accomplished and how you will lead them and direct them. And thank you, Lord, for the years they've spent with us. And, and Lord, for the years that this congregation has fed into them as well. And so, Lord, they have given, but, Lord, they have also received from this wonderful congregation. So, Lord, now we lay them on the altar. We give them to you and thank you and praise you. <laughs> you do all things well. All of us need to answer the call and to where you're leading us and directing us. So thank you, Lord, that they have answered that call and said, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. And we thank you for that heart, their hearts. Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen, amen. My wife was fighting me for my coffee, but I won. I said, you want this to be a good sermon, or you just want it to be the more coffee I have, the better it's going to be? Well, you've been sitting, you've been sitting for five minutes, so stand again. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 28. I just want us to read this together, and then... Uh, then I'll let you sit down. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and for you and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross but God raised him from the dead I love that but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him David said this about him speaking about God in Psalm 16 actually is taken from I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead and will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. So, Lord, thank you for this wonderful passage we have to read. Thank you, God, that already, by the reading of God's word, there has been some impartation. God, I pray this morning, by your spirit, you would lead and you would direct, transform our lives. Everyone said together, amen, amen. Take your seats again, if you can. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you this morning about well, I've been thinking about, well, what does Easter supposed to do? So I'm going to talk to you about living in the afterglow of Easter. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to, to do immeasurably more than we could ask or think. 
Now this describes my take on last Sunday morning and the fact that I got to be a, a part of it. But the fact that it was, it was a privilege for me to be a part of the presentation, The Living Hope, last Sunday morning. Words fail me to describe the sense and the wonder during and after. An email I received this week said it well. It said, it was amazing, awesome, and awe-inspiring. And I say amen to that. And I want you to also know that the crowd, the crowd, that's you. Sometimes you think, do I have a part to play? Yes, you do. You may not be on the platform. You may not be ministering from here, but you do have a part to play. When you come filled with expectancy, when you come filled with the knowledge that God can do the exceptional today, and you come filled with worship and praise, you feed, you feed, you feed. And your life is transformed. Thank you for last Sunday morning. But Easter is more than last Sunday morning. Easter is more than an, than in, an indescribable, wonderful, and moving Sunday morning presentation. But Easter is rather, it's aftermath living. Easter is abundant living today. Easter is, is moving from that Sunday to this Sunday, and on we go. Easter is aftermath living. Well, the heading in my Bible, between Acts chapter 2, verse 13, and Acts chapter 2, verse 14, there is this heading that I kind of got stuck on this week. Here's the heading. Peter addresses the crowd. I really camped on that for a bit. Peter addresses the crowd. And my text is the words coming out of Peter's mouth. Yes, this is foot in mouth, Peter. Yes, this is denying Jesus, Peter. Yes, this is discouraged and downhearted, Peter. What happened to Peter? I'll tell you what happened. The resurrection happened to Peter. That's what happened to him and the baptism and the Holy Spirit, two supernatural, amazing wonders of all time. That is what happened to Peter. Peter bounced back like a Super Bowl. Remember those Super Bowls when you were young? Boing, the way they'd go. There's an afterglow about him, something special about Peter. And so the crowd said, as they looked at Peter, quote, Peter addresses the crowd. They looked at Peter, and the, some laughed and cried, drunk with wine. That's his problem. That's all of their problem. They're drunk with wine. Peter, come on, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And Peter stood up and said, this is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The excitement and life is not coming from a bottle, which I will say is followed by a terrible hangover. How many have been there? This is not from that. This is not being drunk with wine. There is no hangover with this. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is promised by Jesus Christ. This happiness is supernaturally coming from within. It's Easter after glow living. And I'll tell you something. I, I like Peter because I love bounce back stories. Don't you? You love to read accounts of people that have broken through the odds. And Peter was one of them. Last night, I you remember Donny Osmond? Of course you do. If you're my age, you remember back in the 70s. I watched a little bit of 45 minutes presentation of Donnie sharing about his life. Did you know back in the 80s, you're thinking about Donnie Osmond, little puppy love and all that kind of stuff, if you're my age. If you're younger, this is who's Donnie. But he, someone came to him and said, Donnie, in the 80s, they said, Donnie, your name is poison. He lived through a decade, he said, of desert living. 10 years of desert living. The empire, the Osmond Empire, almost went bankrupt. 
10 years of working, 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 and coming against the odds, and people saying, you're finished, you're done, you're washed up, you're poisoned. It was on Broadway, one night on Broadway, and they closed it down. The critics said to him, nasty, terrible things, and he said this, the nasty things that people have said, I put it in a box, and I have never opened it to this day. I didn't read the critics, what they said about me. Too painful. It's in a box somewhere in my home. I have not opened it yet. And he bounced back. And I love stories of people that have bounced back and gone up against the odds and people that say, you can't. And he said, I can, I can, I can. And he did. Oh, people that have rose above circumstances, people that have made lemonade out of lemons. It's choices, isn't it? Again, like I mentioned last Sunday morning, it's choices. Of course it is. It's under the TV every time I see it, the sign. Life is choices, so Gary, choose wisely. Mine's very special. (laughs) I know you're speaking to me. Give me another cup of coffee, Lon. I'm getting low. (laughs) I know she won't. Vern won't. It's all right, I'm... I love those kind of stories, don't you? People that have overcome obstacles, people that have risen up out of their valleys, people have, that have fought back when the chips were down, and, and you know, this was Peter. Overcoming obstacles. Many counted Peter out. Peter, you're done. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question. Would you have voted... For Peter, would you have voted that this would be Peter standing up addressing the crowd? You probably would like like me. No, I would not have voted that Peter would be there standing and preaching, declaring, and and preaching an awesome message. No. I'm not only happy for Peter, I'm thrilled for Peter, but here's something else. I'm so thrilled that Peter, bubbling foot in mouth, Peter denying Jesus, Peter, He has something to say to you and I today. I'm thrilled for Peter, but thrilled for what he can teach you, what he can teach me about my life and about what he can teach you about your life, overcoming obstacles and overcoming those that have said, you're done, you're washed up, you're finished. Let me give you some overcoming power thoughts, five Little ones. Number one, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever say, I am a failure. That was the worst words you could ever say. I'm a failure. You see, viewing yourself as a failure is internal, and that will seal your fate. But rather, failing, you need to see failure as external. It's an action. So you failed, but you're not a failure. See it as an action, but never, never, ever call yourself a failure because you seal your your doom if you do. Number two, view failure as temporary, not permanent. Temporary, not permanent. It's not concrete. It's a puddle that you can walk through. Number three, view failure as isolated incidents, not a way of life. View them as blips on radars. Don't be afraid to laugh at your mistakes. The best thing sometimes you can do is look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, that was hilarious. What's better than beating yourself up? Look in there and say, oh my goodness, how could you be? (laughs) Okay, number four, risk new approaches in the face of all problems. If you first don't succeed, try new methods. Number five, Imitate the rubber ball mentality. The harder the slam, the higher the bounce. There are three kinds of people in the world. Three kinds. Number one, there's the wills. Secondly, there's the won'ts. And thirdly, there's the can'ts. The wills accomplish everything. The won'ts oppose everything. And the can'ts fail in everything. The wills accomplish. The wills accomplish. In the Oakland Tribune, this was written. The greatest achievements of mankind have been accomplished by two types of people. Those who were smart enough to know it could be done and those who were dumb 
too dumb to know it couldn't be done. I'm going to read it again because I don't understand it. I'm... <laughs> I do. I read it 500 times. Of course I do. The greatest achievements of mankind have been accomplished by two types of people. Those who were smart enough to know it could be done. Got it? And those who were too dumb to know it couldn't be done. And I want to be too dumb to thinking that it can't be done. Just do it. There's something about, or something distinguishable about determined people. Determined, people that have that mindset. They're so determined, we can learn from them. Mine the gold out of them. Cripple him, and you have a Sir Walter Scott, one of the greatest historical novelists of all time. Put him in a prison cell for preaching the gospel, and you have a John Bunyan. Have him born in poverty and fighting to read and write, and you have a Abraham Lincoln. Afflict him with asthma until as a boy he lies choking in his father's arms, and you have a Theodore Roosevelt, the youngest president of the United States. He said these words, Theodore Roosevelt, no man has lived a happier life than I. Oh, there was a little brown cork fell in the path of a whale who lashed it down with its angry tail. But in spite of its blows, it quickly arose and floated before its nose. Said the cork to the whale, you may flap and sputter and frown, but you can never, never keep me down, for I'm made of the stuff that's buoyant enough to float instead of to drown. I you love that? It's so cute. I get it. I get it. Don't you get it? What are you made out of? You want to be that little brown cork? You want to be a fighter, a survivor, a warrior? They used to say years ago in the 60s, my dad would go pick a, uh, fill up his tank for $2, and I'd say, $2 worth regular. And we'd go to Texaco. I believe it was Texaco. And they'd say, put a tiger in your tank. And we got, everybody had tiger tails, and they had them swinging by their long antennas. Put a tiger in your tank. You want to be a fighter? You want to be a survivor? You want to be a little cork? See, I love Acts chapter 2 because it describes the effects of Easter. It describes Easter after glow living. Now there is new life. Now there is new breath. Scores of people are bouncing back and they're on the comeback trail. People are wowed and moved and they're in awe at Peter. Peter. He's standing up and he's preaching. His comrades were probably in awe of him. And they were thinking probably that if Peter can stand up here and preach after all that he's been through, then maybe I can do something great for God too. No doubt. They're on the comeback trail. And Peter rises out of his mess. And the church is ready to explode and now the disciples are living in a glowing and a growing and a going season. It's a brand new day. Christ has set the stage for a beginning and sustained life of victory and advancement and accomplishment. It's legacy living at its best. All things were possible to them who would believe. And the same thing is for us today. Nothing has changed in that way. The resurrection still means everything to us, everything to this church, everything to your future, everything to your now, to your tomorrow. It means everything. The same stage is set to live in complete freedom. Really, it's all there to all who will believe. Again, all it takes is Choices, 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 choices. Life is choices. Choose wisely. In my text, as far as the biblical calendar is concerned, we've jumped 50 days from Easter Sunday to Pentecost Sunday. Peter has experienced the resurrected Jesus. The Holy Spirit has fallen. The church has been born, and they're ready to take on the whole world. You know some They're ready to take on the whole world single-handedly. 
They were so filled with the Holy Spirit and fire and purpose and determination. They said, let me at the world. Just let me at them. Let me at sin. Just let me preach. Let me declare the good news that the tomb is empty. You talk about a comeback trail. You talk about fire in their bones. You talk about purpose. You talk about living. Everybody needs purpose. Everybody needs purpose. And as Peter steps up to the plate and preaches his first sermon, I find it amazing that it is a resurrection type of sermon. That's the very first sermon that he preached. I'm going to talk to you about the resurrection, he says. It's a defining message, for it defines why there's such a glow on their face and such a skip in their steps. It's kind of a, a meat and potatoes kind of a message in a sermon. It's the main thing. And so let me talk to you about two things. And, and Peter, there's lots in there, but for time's sake, I just share with you two things that are powerful as we think of this resurrection message. Number one, Peter says, doubt could not keep Jesus down. Doubt. He says in Acts 2, 23, and you, speaking to the men of Israel, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now these wicked guys, they were doubters. They didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. We don't believe anything you're saying. Though on the cross, they taunted him. You know, I've said before, I'll say it again. Covered his face and punched him. And then said, prophesy, who is it that punched you? You think you had it rough. You think you had a bad week. He taunted him, come down from the cross. Save yourself. Then we will be all the temptation that must have been there for Jesus. But Jesus never gave in to man-made conditions and temptations, and you can thank and worship and praise him for the rest of your life for that. He didn't give in to it. He could have. He could have blotted them out, but he didn't. John chapter 1 and verse 1 says he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Acts John chapter 7, verse 5, tells us that even Jesus' own brothers, they didn't believe him. We can even bring the net in a little closer. And zero in a little closer. People in his, own, in his hometown even doubted his claims. Matthew 13, 57, Jesus said that he was without honor in his own country. He didn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. <laughs> we even go hone it in a little bit more. Even his disciples they didn't hang around the cross. They scrambled. They, they hid and hid themselves. In Luke 24, we read of two of the disciples and their doubts. Oh, they said we had hoped. Doubt, there were all, there were all kinds of doubt. Lots of doubt floating around. The amazing message of Easter is that all the doubt that was floating around during that time could not keep Jesus down and in the tomb. It's a good thing there was not power in numbers. It's a good thing there was not power in votes. Now, let us get down to right where you and I live. I love when the passage gets right down to where I live and where you live. Here is what you know. Here is what I know. There will always be the doubters. Always. There will always be doubters that are in your pathway and they count you out. They doubt everything about you. That's what makes living sometimes difficult and rough, isn't it? Of course it is. Doubters kind of speak into your life. You're nothing. You're finished. You're washed up. You'll never overcome this. You'll never get out of the valley. You'll never, 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 ever succeed. You failed before you're done. The doubters will always be with us. They'll always be with you. They'll always be on your trail. They'll always be on your back. But your faith, 
And Christian life is not built upon what the crowd says, but by what the empty tomb says. That is, that is where you get your, your bearings. That is where the foundation, that's where the rock is. Live in the afterglow of Easter. Live above ground and not underground. It's choices again, isn't it? Because Jesus Christ is alive, so can you be alive. Don't allow the naysayers and, and the doubters to speak into your life and cause you to ruin the, the expression and the afterglow of Easter. And what it means, don't allow people to squish you in your box, in a box somewhere, and, and just pump you with doubt. Your life is not built upon what the crowd says you can't do, but by what the empty tomb says that you can do. Live. That's a good spot for an amen if you're looking for a spot. Amen, Gary. I talk to myself quite often, as you know. Amen, Gary. Say it again. Okay, I will. Your life is not built upon what the crowd says you can't do, but by what but by what the empty tomb says you can do. You can rise up above it. Oh, I love that. Okay, let's go to number two. Number one said, Peter said, doubt could not keep Jesus down. Secondly, Peter says, death could not keep Jesus down. Acts 2.24 it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It's like, I've tried at times in the water, get a big ball, blow it up, and try to hold it under the water. Ever try to do that? Can't do it. It bring up to the top. Death could not keep its hold upon Jesus. The religious leaders feared that Jesus' body would be stolen from the tomb. In Matthew 27, it says, they wanted to guarantee there'd be no escape, and so they secured the tomb by placing guards and by sealing with a great stone. It was kind of like a death grip. Let's make sure. And for many people, death is seen as the great inescapable dooming grappling hook. And once it has you chained in its mighty grip, it's over. What a hopeless, what a delusional, personal forecast that is. That after I breathe my last breath, that's it. It's done. Is death easy? Of course not. I always think of Billy Graham when he says, I, I'm not afraid of death. I don't look forward to the process of dying, but I'm not afraid of death. I would say the same thing. I'm not fussy about the process. I'm not afraid of death. My goodness. Read the Bible. Take it in. And don't be afraid of death. Don't like pain, no. But man, you can look forward to what the believer, the Bible calls it the blessed hope. Death, it's a blessed hope of the believer. That when you die, there's no period at the end. There's no question mark at the end. But there is an exclamation mark of excitement. It is not the end, but rather it is just the beginning. Life, they used to say, begins at 40. You maybe remember that. I haven't heard it recently, but I want to tell you this morning that life begins at death for the saints. To be absent, this is really in Scripture. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Is that all that bad? My goodness. It's not bad at all. So shall we ever, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is in the Bible. I choose to believe it. My faith is that's my blessed hope. But there are no losses here. No losses. My dad did not lose his battle with ALS. He didn't lose nothing. But my father gained eternal health and eternal life. Someday I will see my father. Yesterday I found... Oh, man, I wish that abroad this morning. 
I just thought of it now. A belt. I had it somewhere. My wife was cleaning up the house, getting rid of stuff. What are you doing that for? Anyways, and I find, she said, what is this? It's a belt. I got time. It's a belt. My dad made this belt. It's got all these studs on it. He punched every one of those with, I looked as I remember playing with that as a child. I, when I was a superhero, I put it on, you know, get the sword. Now I'm a Superman kind of a little guy. And it was my dad's. He made it. I examined it Friday. I looked at it close and I said, he punched a hole and all. I'll bring it next week. I'll try to work it into a sermon. The work. I text my two sisters. Do you remember this? My younger sister said, yes, I remember. My oldest sister said, man, did he do that? All that work? Oh, my family and I, we always laugh and talk about my father. Whenever I get on the phone with him, we laugh, we laugh, we laugh. Someday, I will see my father. That is the hope. That is what the resurrection secures. Don't get off somewhere. Don't get off the balance beam of what the resurrection actually has provided for you. Keep your nose in the Bible. Keep meditating upon the precious word of God. <laughs> Let me give you some children's statements about death, just in case you're nodding off right now. Hilda, Gilda, I never heard that name before. She's eight years of age. She says, when you die... They put you in a box and bury you in the ground because you don't look too good. Okay, Stephanie, age nine, she said, doctors help you so you won't die until you pay your bills. Must have been from the United States of America. Marsha, age nine, she said, when you die, you won't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher's there too. <laughs> At Raymond, age 10, he said, a good doctor can help you so you won't die, and a bad doctor sends you to heaven. That's good. But Paul cried out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 55, where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting? So he, he fires out the questions, and then he answers them. The sting of death is sin, verse 56. Those in Christ truly are forgiven. Sins are erased, therefore the stinger is gone. The splinter is pulled out, the sting. There's no sting in death anymore. The victory in death, Paul says, is through our Lord Jesus Christ because he lives. We put our faith in him because he lives. We shall live also. This is not the end of it. This is just the preliminaries. This is a little, if I had a long rope that ran all around this church 20 times and just had a little piece of tape at the end, different color, this much. I would say, here's where we are right now. This, that gives me such a wonderful picture when I think of that in my mind. Here's where we are, but look how long that rope goes. Don't get hung up in this little piece right here. Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't get tangled up in the knots of the world. Live in the wonder of the resurrection and what it provides. Before the resurrection, you could... They couldn't get the disciples up and at it. After the resurrection, you couldn't shut them up. Amazing. They're out in the streets, they're in the marketplace, they're preaching, they're just talking, talking, and speaking for Jesus. Before the resurrection, they were afraid. After the resurrection, they were filled with courage. Before the resurrection, they were seeking direction. After the resurrection, they were given direction. Before the resurrection, they were asking questions. After the resurrection, they were giving answers. Before the resurrection, they were afraid to die. After the resurrection, they were willing to lay their lives down for the gospel and for the mission and vision of the church. Anything. Because now they know the answer. Now they know where they're going. Why would they fear death? The fact that death could not hold Jesus down changed everything for the disciples. And it should for us today, too. So I jotted down a couple of things. Gary, what does the resurrection do for you? Well, do his will without questioning. That's what Pastor Vern Heidi are doing. I'm just going to do his will. 
It's open palms, whatever you want, Lord. It's my desire too. It should be your desire, the desire of this church. Do his will without questioning. And then advance the kingdom of God at all costs. Another one, live in the afterglow of Easter. Make a God mark in life, not just a good mark. Why would you settle for a good mark in life when you can make a God mark? These are things I just challenge you myself in, so I, I lay them on the, out for you to think and consider. Then believe in yourself. You know, believe in yourself. Serve others. That's a good one. Here's another one. Dream big and act humbly. Dream big, but act humbly. Another one, work hard for Jesus and never retreat. Never, ever retreat. Then, Gary, then church family, then you can die fulfilled and happy. You can die with a smile on your face. Before my dad went in a coma, he died telling, passing into a coma by telling jokes to nurses. Laughed. He laughed his way into a coma. The nurses came and told my mother that. Dad always had a smile on his face. Why? He just wanted to serve God and serve people and, and humbly act out his life for the Lord Jesus Christ and, and tell others about the Lord. And that's the way he lived. That is the way he died. He knew there was hope in the resurrection someday. I close with this. Larry Norman. If you're my age, you remember Larry Norman back in the 70s, 1970s. Larry Norman, he, he kind of freaked out the church. The church was not ready for Larry Norman in the 70s. And I, I heard all the story. People thought, had all kinds of things to say about him. He had long hair. He was from Hollywood. He would come out on stage to sing and picking his fingernails and just stand there. He would say things out of the ordinary, out of the box, and it just shocked the church. Man, I'll tell you, in the 70s, it was rough. But boy, his lyrics to songs were incredible. Just go YouTube Larry Norman, just visiting this planet. What an awesome album cover. I'm just visiting this planet. He really was. I've said it before, but can I say it again? He's passed on now. Just before he died, he said, I feel like I'm a prize in the Cracker Jack box. And Jesus is reaching into the Cracker Jack cracker jack box and taking the prize out. He's taking me to heaven. He said that before he passed away. But he, he wrote a song that shocked the church. And it was called, Why Does the Devil Have All the Good Music? He just said, it's not fair the devil should have all the good music. You can imagine how the church in the 70s reacted to that. Why should the devil have all the good music? Here's the lyrics. Jesus showed the truth. Jesus showed the way. There's one more thing I'd like to say. They nailed him to the cross. They laid him in the grave, but they were sure to know you can't keep a good man down. The song ends like this. Jesus is rocking and rolling all of my blues away. That's what the resurrection does for us, folks. Let's stand together. Jesus is rocking and rolling all of my blues away. Doubt could not keep Jesus in the tomb. Death could not keep Jesus in the tomb. Therefore, we can rise. We can rise. There is nothing you're facing today that's too big for my Jesus. Nothing. He can do the impossible. Just bring it to his feet. Just let him at it. Just hand it over. I don't care what it is. He, can, he, he will come and he will take it. He'll liberate you. He'll say, now my child, now my child, go walk in freedom. You can live your life in complete freedom through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
And so, Lord, we pause this Sunday after Easter Sunday, and we are so enriched and so encouraged by the life of Peter. And we see the effects that the empty tomb had on this person, this disciple who struggled so much. But after the resurrection, after the power of the Holy Spirit, he went sailing forward. He went sailing upward. And he became the rock that Jesus said he would be. So, Lord, we are encouraged today because all of us have battles. All of us have our struggles. But, Lord, we can bring them to the foot of the cross, bring them to Jesus because he died to pay for that. He died to pay for the penalty. He died to release us from bondages and from pain. So, Lord, whether it's pain from the past, the present, whether it's worries or fears, anxieties, whether it's fearing an operation that's coming up next week, oh, just bring it to Jesus. Bring it to me, you're saying. Let me take you through it. Give it to me. As we sing a song, if you'd like someone to minister to you, just step out. Come down the front, and we'll pray for you.